Life was hard in the Old West. Gangs of outlaws roamed the plains, wild animals were everywhere, and everyone's teeth were terrible, apparently. For some folk, going totally hat stand was just their way of coping with the chaos of this brutal and unforgiving world, and it would be cruel for us to judge them for being weird and wrong. Cruel and fun. So let's get started. You Americans are nothing but shysters and traitors and slippery tongue bull suckers. I'm inclined to agree. Ah. The 19th century was a period of great scientific leaps forward, which gave us such memorable inventions as the steam engine, the light bulb, and the homing tomahawk. Truly a marvel of modern science. One person who knows the incredible power of science is Marko Dragic, a Serbian inventor that Arthur can encounter in Saint Denis. <laughs> no problem, Marko. You are the great genius, so we shall the hot poker up the ice. Marco is demonstrating an invention of his, a remote-controlled boat that can fire miniature torpedoes, sure to be both this Christmas's hottest toy and number one cause of fish deaths. The second time you encounter Marco is at his laboratory in Dover Hill, where he needs your help once more, only this time, instead of something nice and safe, like detonating explosives in a small lake, he wants you to run around with a bunch of lightning conductors during an electrical storm. It's all in the cause of science, however, because Marco has created a robot son who, thanks to you nearly getting yourself electrocuted, is able to walk several steps before falling over and breaking. Arthur, you you know you don't have to say yes to everything people ask you to do, right? Is that it? Well, luckily Marco doesn't ask you to do any more scientific favours for you, mostly because once he made his robot capable of walking more than a few steps, it was also capable of murdering him and running off to the mountains where you can find him apparently feeling pretty bad about killing his dad. Still, think about it this way, robots. You're now the sole heir to his remote control submarine fortune. You should get yourself down the gunsmith, get some fancy engraving done. Do I look like a coward to you? I mean, obviously I do, because I look like that milksop there, but tis no matter. Can you help? Maybe. Sibling rivalry can be a wonderful thing. Why, without sibling rivalry, we wouldn't have sportswear brands Adidas and Puma, the acting career of Liam Hemsworth, or Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds. Okay, maybe not that last one, but sibling rivalry can be a good thing, as long as you're not taking it too far. Taking it too far, like unlikely named brothers Protus and Acrucius, who Arthur can find hanging around Valentine. These two brothers are obsessed with one-upping each other to impress their lady friend Helen, an obsession that manifests itself in increasingly stupid tests of bravery facilitated by Arthur Morgan, the world's most obliging cowboy. Either I'll prove my masculinity or die and be spared his company. Come, sir, please. It starts out innocently enough with the brothers asking you to shoot bottles off their heads. This escalates in their second appearance to them asking you to test their manliness by kicking them heavily in the nuts. <laughs> They've come out his ears! <laughs> My turn! Sure, and of course, culminates, the final time you see them, in them asking you to shove them over a waterfall in barrels. I shall throw myself over the waterfall in just a barrel! And so shall I! Just to demonstrate how little your feeble gestures mean, you homunculus. Thankfully, they both survive, although the experience doesn't seem to have taught them much. <laughs> Good lady, adieu. Bewitch, some other milk sops. We will have none of it. But I, I thought uh, that... Before this siren calls us to the rocks again, let us away from here. Oh yeah, guys, this is all her fault. Great take. It's two dollars a glass. Oh, better be good then. Mm. It's the best. Thank you. Santé. They say that good artists copy and great artists steal. That must make French artist Charles Chatenay a great artist because he is constantly stealing other people's husbands and wives. Hey, are you gonna do right by this feller's wife? You have done right by her. The little bird is free. Hmm. You first meet Charles in a saloon in Saint-Denis, where you discover that he was asked to leave France on account of how bad he is at painting, which was apparently a deportation-worthy offence back in 1899. Next time we see Charles, he asks us to come see his art exhibition at a local gallery, something that sounds like it'll be a fun and cultural experience until we get there and realise that the paintings are all salacious nudes of various townsfolk, something the rest of the attendees realise at about the same time, kicking off a massive riot. 
Stop looking at my husband's buttocks. Mm -hmm. Stop looking at my mama. Well, maybe <laughs> she shouldn't expose herself like that. This is disgusting. The nerve on you! That's it! <laughs> oh, come on, Mildred. This is no place for us. Come here, hey! son of a bitch! In our final encounter with Charles, we help him escape to the South Pacific, although I'm not sure why he needs our help escaping when he has on this flawless disguise. My friend, my friend, it is me, Charles Chatonnet, the painter. <laughs> Okay. Still, we're not doing this just for our health. In return for all our trouble, Charles gives us one of his sketches, which he promises us will be worth something someday. Although I can tell you that this day, right now, it's worth like $4, and I spent $8 buying you brandy, Charles, so what the hell? It's a disaster. Who wants to see a woman wrangle wild animals who doesn't have any bloody wild animals? Come to America, they said. Come to the land of opportunity, they said. Sod you, Daddy, I said. I'm going to America to make it on the stage. I didn't really understand any of that. Margaret, who you can encounter in Scarlet Meadows in Lemoyne, is a circus animal wrangler who dresses as a woman for his act, a deception that might be more convincing if he didn't have a giant unmissable handlebar mustache right in the middle of his face. It turns out that the gender of the animal handler isn't the only misleading thing about Margaret's act, as apparently the animals in question are a smidge less exotic than Maggie would have you believe, as you discover when they escape and he asks you to go track them down. If I see a tiger or a lion or a zebra just roaming around. Exactly! For a start, his zebra is a donkey that he painted stripes on, and his lion is a dog that he strategically shaved. It's also dead, as it's been partially eaten by another of Margaret's attractions, the tiger, who is actually a cougar. Confusing, I know. Strappy eight king, Mr. Margaret. I saw her doing. I always thought they got along. Oh, she liked him just fine. With all this animal confusion, it's understandable that when Margaret asks you to track down his final animal, another lion, Arthur isn't hugely concerned. I mean, it's probably just a cat on stilts or something, right? Sweet mother. Jesus Christ! Well, I guess that answers that. Sorry, Margaret. I'm sure you'll think of something to replace him. Have you considered a cat on stilts? <laughs> no! Bertram! 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 Woof! Woof! Bertram! Put the nice man down! Do something! You'll eat him! Um, uh, it, 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 easy there. Speaking of the circus, Margaret isn't the only performer Arthur can encounter on his travels throughout Red Dead Redemption 2. Head into the Van Horn trading post in the latter part of the game and you can encounter Miss Marjorie, or rather you can encounter the fists of one of her performers, Bertram. Easy, big... Ah! Man, I hope this isn't the whole act. Can't see it being popular. Luckily, it turns out that getting punched in the face by Bertram isn't all you get in the Miss Marjorie Theatre Act. You also get the magical stylings of Magnifico, a magician who has also attempted to dump Miss Marjorie, preferring instead to live in the woods than spend another second as a member of her theatrical troupe. I'm not going back. She's a witch! She's a witch! Who? Presta! Marjorie! Well. Which is a pity, because he's actually pretty good at what he does, as you'll discover when you try and catch him. Hey, will you talk? Still, eventually you'll catch up to Magnifico, at which point he'll return to Miss Marjorie's trio, allowing them to put on their spectacular stage show once more. What kind of a two-bit show is this? Your freak nearly killed me! Man, good thing movies were just invented. Why today, isn't it? Sure. What a country. I'm working on a project. Photography. Yeah, I guess that bit. <laughs> of course. Wildlife. That's my thing. The period in which Red Dead Redemption 2 is set was a time of great scientific and social change, meaning that there were a lot of jobs for people that hadn't existed previously, such as horrible taxidermist or giant therapist. I've always wanted a real friend. Someone to discuss the human condition with, you know? One such profession was that of wildlife photographer, which is possibly why this guy, Albert Mason, doesn't really know how to do it properly. Indeed, in their first meeting, Albert somehow manages to get mugged by a coyote. And Kyle, don't think about coming back! Yeah, you tell him, Arthur. Things don't get much better from then on out, with subsequent meetings involving him nearly being eaten by wolves. My, they don't seem to be fans of modern technology. On the other hand, looks like they may be fans of you! And alligators. Still, at least he starts to see reason and switches to trying to photograph gentler animals such as horses and birds. I mean, how can you get in trouble photographing birds? This area is quite safe. Quite. Quite. Oh! Oh! Ah! 
Oh, yeah, like that, I guess. Now, you've helped me develop the most humane machine imaginable, a way to induce calmness to our most troubled souls, a way to end the barbarity of a public hanging. Oh, so, so humane. What are you talking about? The electric chair. What? Our weirdo senses were already tingling the first time we met Professor Andrew Bell III on account of how he told us he needed 100 gallons of moonshine for a machine of love. I'm building a machine. A machine of love. Hey, what you do in your spare time is none of our business, man. Turns out, however, that the machine Professor Bell is referring to is an electric chair, although quite why that needs 100 gallons of strong booze is a subject for another time. Anyway, it's a good thing we came along when we did, because it seems as if Bell is incapable of doing anything on his own, requiring us to get both the permit to test the chair and a wanted criminal to test it on, the unfortunate Wilson McDaniels, who Arthur does a pretty poor job of selling on the merits of being fatally electrocuted. Your debt's gonna be in, uh... Important step in the advancement of human knowledge. What in hell are you saying, mister? Anyway, after all this errand running, Professor Bell is finally ready to test his new invention, and it works about as well as you'd expect a makeshift electric chair constructed by a jerk who doesn't know what he's doing to work. In incredible! He's nearly dead! So humane! Ah! <laughs> Worse, in fact, as it somehow manages to kill Bell as well. So, how many can I put you down for? Anyone? Oh. So, those were some of the weirdest weirdos that we met throughout Red Dead Redemption 2. Let us know in the comments below who your favourite eccentric characters are, and make sure you are subscribed and hit the bell icon to be notified when we upload loads more Red Dead Redemption 2 videos very soon. Thanks for watching.